Hello, everyone, and welcome to New York Textile Month's event with Lori Weitzner today. We are so happy to have Lori with us uh, again this year. She did a beautiful talk last year as well. My name is Ragna, and I'm the director of New York Textile Month, and I welcome all of you. And I also want to encourage you to check out uh, our program at textilemonth.nyc. We still have few very important events coming up uh, in our program this month. And it has been a lot of um, fun here in New York, uh, celebrating textiles in a small and larger, on a small and larger scale. Um, there is uh, tomorrow another textile TV at lunchtime with Renata Morales from Brazil. And I'm sure it's going to be beautiful and very interesting. It's going to be streamed live from Sao Paulo from her studio and she will talk about her textiles and her work and um, I can promise that it's going to be a very interesting event. Um, I also want to highlight one event that I my personally experienced, which is the Gandhi weaving at Loop of the Loom in Brooklyn. There are still two evenings there uh, tomorrow night and also in a week. It's very beautiful. It's so inspiring to go to the studio there and do some spinning and uh, learn about Kati and, um, and spinning with wool and also with cotton. And this is on Thursday night, um, our annual webinar, a full long day webinar, uh, Titan Textiles is this Friday from 9 to 4, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's called The Art of Textiles from Arts and Crafts to the New Creative Age. It's created by Philip Himano, and it's a very interesting program. It's free for all students and faculty, but we charge $150 for others who are not students and faculty, but it includes also one of our newest publications of um, Talking Textiles, issue number six, which is dedicated to weaving this year. So, and there are a lot of other interesting events uh, this weekend. Uh, we also have two big openings. One is at Mana Contemporary New Jersey, and the other one is at Urban Sand. Both are with MFA students from Parsons. Uh, very uh, interesting exhibitions, both of them. But today, so please, textilemonth.nyc, all the program is there and more information. And we also have our Instagram, of course. There's a lot there. So I want to introduce you to Lori Weitzner, who is a good friend of ours and um, a wonderful designer. Um, she has a design studio in Tribeca, right, Lori? It's in Chelsea. Tribeca. In Close, Chelsea. Oh, yeah, Chelsea, sorry, Chelsea. And she mainly focuses on uh, textiles and wallpaper, but she is also the author of the book, um, Ode to Color, and I encourage you to look that up. And she is going to share with us wonderful stories today about her work and her relationship with um, artisans around the world. So Laurie, welcome, and we are so happy to have you and share your beautiful work and uh, your stories. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Ragna, very much. And hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here talking about my absolute favorite subject, which is the work that we do with artisans around the world. So I'm gonna give you a little context and, <clears throat> and then hopefully at the end, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat um, because I'd love to answer any questions you have if I'm able to. So I'm gonna start with, um, hang on. Um, the title, Forward Thinking, Handmade Products for the Modern World. And that's very specifically the title because that's what we are doing. We are working with artisans in the communities, but making sure that we can develop products that are actually viable. And um, this is just a quote that means probably the most to me. And the reason why I love working with artisans, there is nothing like it. And if you're a textile lover, and even if you're not, you get it, you feel it, even if you don't know exactly how it was made or where it comes from. So to give you a little context first, um, the, it started when I was really young and I got really lucky because my parents liked to take me 
traveling. Uh, we weren't the family that went did sports. I'm a terrible athlete, but I got to travel and go to really cool places. This is me. I can't believe how, <laughs> how, um, anyway, that was a long, long time ago, but I saved that passport all these years because I was so proud of all the different stamps on it. Um, so I was very, very fortunate in that way. And as I would travel, I kept diaries and my diaries would always talk about um, where I was, what I saw and what I ate. Every meal of the day was written in my diary, which is also quite interesting. The other thing that was very fortunate for me growing up was my dad who worked all the time. I have very little memory of him except on Sundays, he took me to the Met every Sunday. So we lived in Westchester, which for those of you may or may not know, is a suburb of New York City. So it was a 45 minute drive in every Sunday. He worked every other day of the week and we would go and we would walk around to wherever. And I had this feeling that if I could touch the sculpture or the painting or whatever it was that was created by this famous artist, by you know, I would somehow get, <laughs> get that in me. And so I did a lot of that and um, got into trouble. The guards would always be like, Shh, hey, hey, you can't do that. But then I just go into the next room and do it a little bit again. Here's me traveling again. This is the first time I was in Paris with my very chic coat and beret. Oh my God, my, I don't know, my sense of fashion hopefully has improved since then. That was my older sister. This is me not looking so happy, but um, I really, it's just not a great picture, but it's one of the few pictures I have of my dad and with me traveling. And I wanted to show that because he's really responsible for the travel we did. And this is as I get a little older and going again to faraway places in the desert, in the far East, Middle East, here in Africa, which completely changed my life. Um, but that's a story for another day in Malaysia, in India. And the one thing I'll just stop for a moment here is this really is incredible in person, no matter how many pictures you've seen. And I almost, when I was in India the first time, said, no, nah, I don't need to see it. I've seen enough pictures of it. But when you see it in real life, the Taj Mahal is quite astounding. And then of course, when you can't travel, which all of us have experienced in the last couple of years with COVID, um, there's books, there's always books and bookstores. My, my favorite thing to do. And that has been my saving grace um, when we haven't been able to. The um, other thing that I learned really early on was about keeping all our senses open. So I learned about synesthesia and I don't know how many of you out there and I'd love to know in the chat if you do know what that means, but it's about where all the senses combine. And evidently we all have this ability, but at about six months of age, we kind of lose it and learn to separate out our senses. You smell, you taste, you see, you touch, et cetera. But if you could, and that's what synesthesia is, experience all of those at the same time, everything would be that much more um, impactful. So as I traveled to these far off and wonderful places, and as I got older and was able to save enough money to do it even more and on my own, I always made sure that all my senses were aligned and working together so I could have the full blown experience of them. And with that gave me, with that and um, Jack Larson, who I'll talk about in a minute, that gave me the beginnings of where I wanted to take much of the product that we develop today um, and figure out how to make that work. These are just some beautiful images that I love that are inspiring to me that come from all different places um, that I've been. So here we go, identifying the potential. So I get a question all the time with my work because um, we're developing these very high-end textiles and wall coverings and passementery and jewelry for um, places that'll go into, let's say the Four Seasons Hotel and, and all these high-end residential homes. How do you identify, how do you figure out how to even begin working with these communities? So the first person I say is you've got to find the artisan or the community, and you've got to make sure that they are able to develop a product for me, it's about using their traditional methods, but then collaborating with them to do more contemporary design that speaks to the brand, which is Weitzner. Then there has to be some innovation. So it's kind of like a recipe and we're cooking. 
And the innovation is about inventing something new. So we're taking an old technique, we're taking communities that have been doing something and steeped in tradition and then throwing something new into it. Then there's the business side, which often is the biggest challenge, but to make sure that there's an understanding of what this means. Meaning if they make something for, for me, for my company, I need to make sure that they can repeat it and they can match the color and they can, can keep consistent quality because these are all the realities when you're in business and not doing one of a kind pieces. The viability, which I really just talked about and also the fact that they want to do this and they wanna grow and be sustainable. So when I talk about sustainability and that's a big word that everybody talks about all the time, I have a little bit of a different or more general definition, which is not necessarily that it's recyclable or upcycled. It means the capacity, and this is a definition from Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the capacity to support, maintain, or endure. That can mean so many things. So for me, I like to talk about cultural sustainability and how we can sustain these wonderful artisan communities through these five concepts or ideas to make worthwhile product. So I have some mentors and I always like to talk about different mentors in my lectures because I don't, I, for you, my, this audience, but for anybody out there, no matter how old you are, how successful you are, having mentors is really important. They can be people you've never met. They can be people you just admire. They people you know intimately who um, inspire you advise you, guide you, and um, you know, counselor you. And so I have three I picked out that I'll just talk about real quick for this presentation. They may be on your list, they may not be. I picked them specifically for this talk because they do what I do and even better, whereas they work with artists and communities, but they make a product that's viable commercially and selling in beautiful places. My um, this is the only one that doesn't do that, but he's my mentor, my, my cousin, Stuart, who is no longer alive, but he was a very, very successful businessman and he retired early. And one day I'm just talking to him about life and my business. And he said, well, why are you doing it this? And why are you doing that? And I was trying to explain, he said, no, 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 no. You need to do this, this, and this. And then he agreed to help me with my business. And he said, I'll help you. Along the way, I know nothing about design and he's instrumental in so much of what I've done. Stuart is his name and I will forever honor him. Alexandra Lamont is one of my first um, <coughs> mentors in that I, I do know him, I've met him. I've worked with him in Thailand. He's British, he moved to Thailand many years ago and he created a foundry he, and um, marketry he has over 150 artisans working for him from local communities in Thailand. And he does furniture and he does um, lighting and all kinds of beautiful products. He does giant bronze sculpture and then things that are mirrors, gilding. I'm sure many people have seen this, but everything is made by him. And he's made a very successful business of it. And in turn has for his 150 artisans provided them with very good life. Christina Kim from Dosa, which I'm guessing lots of you in the audience know. I loved her for years. I used to go to her little shop in Soho and buy all her clothes. And I love this quote from her, every piece is precious. And that's the other compelling factor to handmade. Even though some of it may look the same, none, no one piece is ever exactly the same. And she also recycles, upcycles, takes existing materials and creates fashion in a different way with them. Um, and I admire so much how she's been able to find artisans to understand what she wants to communicate and, and do it so effortlessly and beautifully. Um, so I just love these and I will never give up my dosa uh, fashions, even if she decides not to. And finally, Jacqueline R. Larson, who I had the privilege of working for and designing collections for, and he only recently passed away at a very ripe old age. I honor him. He was the first to teach me that it is indeed possible to travel all over the globe and figure out how to bring back 
product made by artisans and make it viable commercially. These are just, indul I'm indul oh, indulging myself with these pictures that bring back memories, but this is the best quote of all. I like ancient techniques and the cutting edge. The extremes are always more interesting than the middle. And that kind of sums up what his work was about and hopefully what some of my work is about. Um, that's him at a young age working. He's got very famous textiles that are in museums. He was always going to all kinds of places in Pakistan and India and Thailand and Asia and Japan, all over. And when I started working for him was where he gave me the gift of travel and to develop my own products with some of these artisans. This is Magnum, one of his most famous pieces. And now we're gonna start with the model. So, as I said before, identify the potential, the art in the community. Being able to talk with them is really super important. So sometimes, for example, when I'm developing product in Philippines, I need interpreters. Um, so you, that's always possible. The ability to understand the market requirements, that they understand what my needs are. I'm giving out samples to interior designers and architects that they may not order the product for two years and it needs to match that sample. The ability to evolve the design and collaborate with me so that we can get to where we really need to go and that they're interested. And now I'm going to take you on a little bit of a road trip um, to, I think it's six different countries, and just give you a taste of what I can do with these and what I have done with these beautiful people and beautiful countries. And I'll start with Japan. And what's really interesting about the countries is as you grow in this profession and you do this work, you learn where to go for the, what you need. For example, you work in a country using a material that's inherent and indigenous to that country. It doesn't make sense. I tried once to do um, leather in a country that didn't have leather and it didn't make any sense. It just costs so much. So you have to think about that. Now, what I'll tell you about Japan is there's no other country where I find the level of aesthetics is equal to the level of innovation. They have amazing sense of sensibility and they have amazing technology. Now, they are not inexpensive to work with. So I have to be very careful with what products I choose to do in Japan that it makes sense economically because again, I'm in business, not just doing this for my own art. So the handmade washi papers and all those wall coverings that I have many of all done in Japan because the paper is made there. And that makes total sense. This is just playing around in the studio where we have designs. The other thing that we, we've done, and this is just one cool example, is I think most of you may know what flocking is, um, but if you don't know, it's basically the old glue and glitter. When you're a kid, you glue where you want the glitter to stick and then you blow the rest away. Well, we have flocking for textile and for wall covering, usually with a polyester or some kind of that. But in Japan, we decided we would flock tea leaves. So we ground up tea leaves, which smelled heavenly, and we flocked it into a wall covering. In this case, the wall covering talks about all the flavors of tea. And just to say, when you put it up on the wall for about three months, the smell, the smell lasts. This is also the more traditional way of flocking. It's like, feels like almost like a raised cut velvet, but it's actually not. It's made with particles that get stuck to a glue that's done with a screen. All done in Japan, makes total sense to be done in Japan. This is called beguile. These are some of their handmade papers that I like to foil print on. And they do embroidery as well there. Other countries do too. So depending on what kind of embroidery I wanna do, I may go to them and I may go to someone else. This is a beautiful collection of wall covering we did with an artist, Lisa Hunt. And it has this foil print. It's absolutely beautiful in person. So everybody always says, oh, you work in all these countries, Lori. What about the US? Absolutely the US where it makes sense. So we have um, a, a wonderful um, group of, of people who do gilding for us and hand make some of the papers for us. This is one of our wall coverings we launched a long time ago. And it was when I thought, why does the wall covering have to cover the wall completely? Why can't the wallpaper and the wall play with each other and talk to each other? So we have holes and then you paint your wall any color, you layer this over with clear paste and it makes a really beautiful wall covering or lampshade. 
And the designer can paint the color any wall or the consumer, any, any color they want. I love this. And this became the beginning of me doing a whole series of wall coverings with holes. And this just shows you some of what people have done with the product. And what's super cool is when you show the artisans how people, how designers are using the work, um, it's, they, they love it. They get so excited. They're very focused on the product, but they don't just to step back and see how it actually looks in an interior. The other thing we do in the U.S. are these paintable plasters. So this is really cool. It's relief. It's a, a patented malleable plaster that you can paint any color you want. So it gives real dimension. It feels almost architectural. And yet it's all done by hand with stencils. Designer, you can paint it any way you want. Here's an example where someone gilded it. But interestingly enough, a lot of people keep it white. And this is also done there. The Philippines is a country that I do a ton of work with. And that's um, some of the group that I work with. They're <clears throat> amazing people. And I work with a group of hand weavers, women, all women, part of an organization that's partly sponsored by the government there. It's on an island outside of the Philippines. And they all go every day to a home where there's a much bigger space with these looms in an open space and they weave. And they weave the most beautiful things with abaca and silk. And abaca, if you don't know, is banana fiber or piña they also use, which is pineapple fiber. And sometimes, um, and, and the Philippines is abundant with abaca because they have lots of banana leaves. So that makes total sense. And it's very fine work that they're doing. And then they weave this and then it goes to Japan where it gets paper backed and colored grounds, tinted colored grounds, and then it becomes the most beautiful grass cloth you've ever seen. But it's actually not grass, it's silk and abaca. And just another example, which is 100% abaca that they've hand woven, which we then goes to Japan to get layered on colored paper. And you may say, well, why does it have to go to Japan after it's made in the Philippines? And it's because we haven't been able to find paper backers to do the right job in the Philippines till now. So that's where you have to kind of know where to go for what. Um, and these are just some of the fibers we work with it's because we also work with an amazing paper maker there. And we are, um, it's again an open air facility and we have a series of about 12 of the most beautiful handmade panels. This gives you an idea of how they get made. And this gives you an idea of how they look on the wall. So you paint the wall any color or you can sandwich them in glass. They are made from either abaca, mulberry leaves, piña, or um, I'm missing one, but I can't remember for the moment. But anyway, they get mixed in this giant bat for any of you who've made water and, and handmade paper. And you know, to me, paper is part of textile. We, and, cannot be excluded because we weave with it and we print on it. And this just on the right is just an example of, I was shopping for shoes in Saks Fifth Avenue and I couldn't, well, I did find shoes I love, but they were too expensive. And then I turned around and I saw our wall covering used as display in the shoe department. And I was so excited that this beautiful handmade pulp from all recycled materials, made it to Saks Fifth Avenue. And of course, then I did buy the shoes. Um, and here's just another example of how beautiful these things, and they bring soul to a space because you can't get it from the pictures, but all of the, the, the wrinkles and creases that you get from the paper is there and bookshelves, and it just can enhance any space. So these are just a few examples of that. This is one of our new ones called Narrative all done in the Philippines and all different ideas for how you can enhance your space. I actually had one person show me that they had Ikea kitchen cabinets with glass and they bought a panel and cut it up and just stuck it with scotch tape behind the glass and it just enhanced the kitchen cabinets in a beautiful way. And then of course we do color and that is interesting, handmade paper and getting the color right. And um, it can be challenging because when you're working with handmade, if it's gonna be in direct sunlight, it will fade. And we have to let our clients know that. Um, we do testing and we give them all the you know, necessary instruction. Here is a, a paper tile. So we move, we do panels, but then we decided to do tiles. And this has been a great success for us. We're again in the Philippines. Um, this partner 
was so keen to keep pushing the envelope with us that it's been a relationship that has been almost 15 years um, in the making. And there's the wonderful fiber we, where it comes from and that's what those Avica fields look like. And just to give you an idea also of the challenges of handmade, when there was a typhoon there, all the fields of, of Avica were gone. And then the delays for delivery was nine months. And we have clients with orders waiting where is my product? And we explain, well, there was a typhoon and we don't have Avica. And, you know, it's sort of, you have to get people to understand this product is made from the ground up and therefore sometimes you have to be patient. And this is also now weaving with Avica and then doing cool stuff with it. Um, and this is beading, this is passementary, all also done in the Philippines. So the Philippines is a big one for us, as is India. And in India, We've got, um, the inspiration is just everywhere. In my book, Ode to Color, I write a whole essay about my first time in India where I was just so whoosh overwhelmed with all the polarities, the smells, the taste, the wonderful smells, the toxics, the rotten fruit smells, like all of it. There's just so much. And it's so like your senses kind of go on hyper and it's so magnificent. Um, we do all our, a lot of our cut and sew there and they do wonderful cut and sew. This is an origami shear that we did with a just silk and linen that they would cut and stitch for us. That's beautiful. We do a lot of batik there. Um, and I just love the way that ad, that came out. We have a very famous award-winning wall covering called Newsworthy, which is all made from strips of newspaper shredded. We gather from around the world and then it's woven. And this is done there. And then it again, it gets paper backed in Japan and then it comes back to us and goes into like Will, this is Will Ferrell's home. So it, it's just amazing that it can go from the beginning, which is a, a newspaper that's been thrown out to this. We did the same thing with maps and cinema posters, Bollywood cinema posters. This one's really fun. Uh, I love that picture with the canary. And this just shows you some of the ways. And the most recent launch of this embroidery with applique, we've done, uh, we just launched this now. So we added this slide in, all done um, in India. And that just shows you what it looks like. Applique, stitching, all of that. India is the perfect place. Passementary, we've done there. Again, applique, special beading. This is for Samuel Sons, a company I designed. Passementary for, which I call jewelry for the home. And the beading and the attention to detail, these are our little bugs ensemble, is beautiful. And all of this makes sense to do. And the artisans are always up for the challenge. And they love when we bring them new ideas, but they're using their old techniques, their ancient techniques that are passed down from generation to generation. And it's what's amazing is it gives them a livelihood too. All of this helps them to do more of what they love so they don't have to become waiters or, or bus drivers. They can actually do the craft that they love to do. These are earrings. I, I'm actually wearing some today. I have a line of jewelry that's all textile infused, most of it made in India and the Philippines. And I started that business only about a year and a half ago because I wanted to find other ways to support artisans. And it's going really well. It's kind of a, a little bit different for jewelry, but people are loving the handmade quality, the unique quality of it, the lightweight of it, and just the whole concept of textile and fuse. Some people call it bohemian chic look, but this just gives you an idea, all hand done. And these artisans that work on this are amazing. This is specifically with these little um, sequins going in and up. And then to me, it feels so modern, but it also feels like it could be Louis XIV. Um, and it's very delicate. Thailand, Thailand, I've been able to do, it's my, one of my favorite countries to visit, but a little bit more challenging to develop product in. Why? I learned this. They are so steeped in their traditions that they're a little bit timid, I'm generalizing, to branch out into trying something new with their old techniques. So when I started in Thailand, I was starting to work with Thai silk wall covering. That was easy, easy, easy to do. Um, and they did it perfectly and we have it in our collection and we sell it a lot and it's great. But then we can't just keep doing the Thai silk. We wanted to push the envelope. These are, by the way, the, the silkworms. Never forget where silk comes from. It's 
incredible. I think we take it for granted and forget. So I want that picture to remind you of the harvesting of, of silk. And if you ever have an opportunity to visit a silk farm, I was able to in Thailand, which was very, very special. Those are the cocoons um, and the dyeing of the silk. So we, we did the Thai silk and these are some of our lovely friends who, who made it for us. And this was it. We did it as fabric and wall covering, but then it was time to, to get to do something different. And we went for a visit and they almost didn't show us this yarn. They kept showing us more Thai silk, Thai silk, Thai silk, very traditional, beautiful, but we've done that. We need to do something new. This mill was owned by a woman and her daughter. And then her daughter came out with this yarn and said, well, we developed this yarn. I don't, you know, she was almost shy to show me. And it's the waste from the floor of the, the looms every day that were weaving silk. They like, gather all the waste, spin it and make a new yarn. And I was like, oh my God, we need to do something with this yarn. And that's me having so excited at this meeting with my frizzy hair, because it's very humid in Thailand. And here's what we came up with. So we combined the Thai silk and some Thai cotton with this special yarn. So the mother said, I did not want her to show you this. It doesn't feel like it's appropriate. And the daughter, the new younger generation said, no, we need to try to explain to her mother, we need to push. So that was a big, wonderful lesson and how to find new ways to continue to work in Thailand. So we also found and identified some paper makers there. And we did some really beautiful papers where you could see the, um, the selvages and crazy things that some people are doing with them. Nepal is, is actually so spiritual and so special. And um, we do a lot there as well. Um, but I always try and find a reason to do even more there simply because I just wanna visit it all the time. There is a feeling you get when you arrive that you are in a, some far off distance place, but where spirit and humankind collide. And I say that not in a religious way, it's just in a spiritual way. It's beautiful. Those are the typical wedding dresses. So the next time I get married, well, I'm not gonna hopefully get married again, but oh my God, forget the white. I wanna wear that next time or when I renew my vows, I should say. And here's the lovely women that we work with. They weave for us with jute, with hemp. Um, this is a case where we had hemp and it's abundant of hemp there, but we wanted to mix it with something for glamour. So we brought in um, a, a, a Lorex, a shiny yarn and mixed it in with the really dry hemp so pretty and then this is another where we use lacta paper which is local there but we wrapped i wanted it to look like it was metal so we wrapped some of it with the foil this is the tapies the jute with the with the, all of this handmade hand woven this is called saison where they paint and then they strip and then they weave it beautiful uh getting to the end so bear with me indonesia indonesia is another place where we are um doing a lot. And this is actually visiting, um, it's a famous jeweler, Hardy, Hardy, John Hardy. I think it's John Hardy. And he has all his artisans there. I know they sold the company a few years ago, but I was lucky enough to be there when, and I don't know if it's still like this, but where all the artisans were working and it was magnificent and so inspiring to me. Um, but here are just all the things you see everywhere in Indonesia. I mean, just incredible, the artisanship, the jewelry. Um, but we do a lot of our papers there as well. And here is a paper where it's a, metal, a matte metallic and then we tear it. And then it becomes this beautiful panel with zigzag tear lines. You could not achieve that anyway, but handmade. You could mimic it with digital print but it will never look, it will never feel the dimension. I mean, at this image, you can just reach out and touch it and you know that it's got a soul to it. We also do, they do plating there. So we decided because we're so successful with our upcycling of newspapers, recycling, we would take magazines and plate them. And this has been a great seller for us called Kodiak. And it goes into super cool places. And it's all again, made from collecting magazines and working with them. Um, and we have here another type of concept where we strip and in between we add strips of bamboo. Um, as you can see, she's doing here. 
and that's just an example of how it looks. And then we, we, we also wanted to do our take on a grass cloth and they had the most wonderful yarns to work with there that they spun themselves. So we worked with those. And then we tried a, a faux leather. And this is where we um, maybe could have done a better job with, we had to bring in the faux leather so they could weave it. And we learned that um, um, there might, that, again, like working indigenously. I mean, I'm showing you most of the wins. I'm not showing you many of the things that didn't work out. But believe me, for every win you see here, there are probably um, eight losers, or when I say losers, things that just don't work. And then we decided to take and twist the magazines and do a really chunky, meaty one. This is called Headlines, and it, it's fabulous. Um, so why? <laughs> well, if you don't already know why, I'll, I'll sum it up I'll, for you. The obvious, creating beautiful products is good business. And no matter how virtual we get in life now, no matter how many Zooms we're doing versus in person, people want to touch and feel. And that is why Textiles, New York Textile Month is having its moment and will continue to grow in its moment as the years go by, because people start to understand that you can have lots of things around you or wear lots of things, but it's the textile that I believe brings soul to the space or to the body. The other number two reason, not that these are in any special order, are how to help artisans maintain a sustainable life. I said in the beginning of my talk, cultural sustainability is a really important initiative for Lori Weitzner design and for Weitzner limited design. And we make sure that there's a very high percentage of that infused into the work we do. It's not everything, it can't be everything. Um, I don't want it to be everything, but as much as possible, wherever possible, and wherever artisans are game. And kind of what I said all along in this whole presentation is the handmade is critical to keeping us human and connected, absolutely. Um, in a way that the computer and the phone just can't. And here are just some of our lovely, wonderful artisans around the world that are working with us and that are happy and creative and hopefully healthy, hopefully. And that's it. So that's my presentation. And um, I know there are, are other things happening, but it's, it's, there's time. I would love to give you time if you have any questions, if you wouldn't mind just writing them in the chat and I will stop share um, so that I can, yeah, I think that's better now. And um, I move, oh, I'm moving too fast. I'm sorry. Oh my God, Sheila, you said that at like one, at one fifteen, and it's now half an hour later. Did I go too fast? I'm sorry. Well, we'll we're oh, going to figure sorry. out. A, we'll figure out a way to make it available to those who want it, um, because I probably did go too fast. You know what it is? I feel like everyone's so tired of Zooms, and everyone's busy and has lots on their plate, and I want to get it all in. I don't want you guys to miss anything. So I feel like. If I, if I go quicker, you'll, the chances are you'll stay on longer, if that makes any sense, like to listen to it all. But anyway. Um, Thank you so much, Lori. This was really great. Good. And we can actually, we could send out the, um, a link that is open for a month of time to the participants because we have your emails. Yep. But I see that there are questions in the chat. Okay. And Shoot. someone is asking for your email. Do you want to? Do you want to share it or is it on your website? Um, yes, on my website, there is an email info at lauriweitzner.com mm -hmm. and it'll, it'll get to me. It'll totally get to me. And if you forget that, just go to my, excuse me, go to my website and also go to my website. Um, if you want to take the color test, which is free, it's 18 questions and it's called Ode to Color. So um, any other questions? Uh, yes. How here is someone in on bricks? How do you navigate working as a white person with the 
sphere of traditional practices from people of color? I have to say, it's an interesting question, but it's never been an issue um, and never even anything I've actually thought about one way or another. Like, I don't know if this sounds weird or not, but I'm not seeing color. Like I'm seeing mm -hmm. artisans work and what they do. And um, so it's more about, um, it's more about, it's all about the work. And we connect about the work and the creativity because I'm working with aesthetists as well as me. So that's that's our that's how we connect. So it's never even it's never anything I've ever really thought about one way or the other. Mm -hmm. It's never been an issue or anything. Um, and my goal is to support artisans mm -hmm. in communities wherever they may be. And there's another one here. Uh, how do you, how often do you come out with wallpapers and do you make other products beyond wallpapers? Uh, I come up with wall coverings twice a year. If spring and fall, we launch collections and those are all shown on the Weitzner Limited site. So I have two websites, lauriweitzner.com and then weitznerlimited.com. And the Weitzner Limited is the wall coverings and the fabrics. And um, they're all managed there and all the SKUs and you need samples and all of that is there. And then the Lori Weitzner site is more just like everything that I do. So that's twice a year for most things seem to have a twice a year launch schedule. Mm -hmm. Someone here, Elizabeth Hostford, Hostford is asking how to manage returns if a client doesn't like piece they receive because it is so unique. Um, so there is a certain consistency. We're not selling one of a kind, but um, so there's a standard that we, we say, well, it should match, but if there's an off, let's say it's off color, we usually set, let the client know, we send them a sample to see if they can approve it um, and it's okay for them. So if something is, is farther, we have what we call a 5% tolerance. So if it's 5% different, um, that's okay. If it goes beyond that, we need to check with our customer or client before we ship it to them. If, they, if it's exactly what it, the sample looked like, but they just decide they don't like it, then there's different rules depending on which company it's for. Like past, you know, because Weitzner has some rules, Passementary, Samuel Sons has others, jewelry is other, so. Mm -hmm. And here, Nancy Abrose is asking, where can I see more of the original window shears? They were beautiful. The original what? Sorry? Window shears. Shears? Yeah. Oh, um, thank you. It, on the Weitzner Limited website, if you just go there and, and you put in shears or, or window treatments or something, you'll see all of them. I mean, the pictures aren't great, but they're good enough for you to get going. And then you can get samples easily by, um, depending on where you are, you would have a rep in your territory, or if you're in a place where you have a, sh there's a showroom, you can go there and look at it there. And if you're not a designer or an architect, there's always a way to sell it to you. We, we have interior designers on our team who can help purchase it for you, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And here is someone asking, how do you find clients? Um, clients, well, that's that's been years in the making. <laughs> I mean, it's slow. Like, I mean, I'm old. It it it's it you know it's a process. But we do have for the for for the a lot of the products I design, we have reps and showrooms that show it, and they are the heartbeat to the to making it all work. So they take what we design and then they present it to clients all over the world. And they're the ones that manage the sales and manage the relationship. And so I'm always grateful to them and probably don't talk about them enough. Mm -hmm. They're like an integral part of this because for all of us as textile designers um, or creatives, like it's one thing to create these beautiful things, but then what? You know, if you're doing it as art, that's one thing and that's amazing. But if you wanna do it as a viable commercial product, you need operations, you need salespeople, you need distribution. So that's, that's covered and thank God, not by me. 
<laughs> okay, there's, um, yeah, here's someone, what is your background history with weaving and textile production? So this is really interesting. Um, I was a painting major in college and I wanted to be a painter. And my professor said, what are you gonna to do to make a living? I said, I'm gonna be a painter. He said, no, <laughs> you're not good enough. You're not gonna make it. You should be a textile designer. So I changed my major, but then you had a choice. I was at Syracuse. You could do weaving or you could do print, which is to me crazy because I think it should all be under one <laughs> roof, but I had to choose. So I went for print. I did not learn weaving until Jack Larson. And the first, actually before Jack, what happened was I went to Italy. Um, I had a job out of school at Fieldcrest Designing Bedding. I wasn't happy. I quit. I went to Europe with a portfolio trying to sell my, my designs. And these Italian mills would look at my paintings, my painterly things and say, let's weave it. Let's weave it. And I'm like, you're going to weave that? And it was a whole new world to me that actually with Jacquard, you could take like Cezanne watercolors and weave them. And that was the beginning of me connecting painting with weaving. And then of course, Jack Larson was the one who really brought it home to me. Mm. So. And here's a related question a little bit. Do you think handloom weaving can make a comeback in the textile industry for apparel clothing? Apparel or clothing, where does handloom weaving stand currently? Do you feel like it's still disappearing as a craft? I think, um, Ragna, you might be better off answering that question than me. No, I think yeah, it's an interesting question because I think actually there is a comeback in handloom weaving. You know, there is a, it is being more used in the fashion industry. I mean, especially for like smaller labels, but there's also one, um, element to it it's a lot of course used now in fine arts which has you know more than ever i think you know all kind of artists even if they don't have a background in textiles mm -hmm. they use the handloom weaving uh, as a medium which is very interesting and that's in regards to the tactility you were talking about Lori. you know that it's the need of tactile things and that is also the reason why we have so much textiles in the fine art world I right think. Right. And um, but I think, yeah, I would say that there is. It has a place in the apparel and the clothing industry, but never maybe on a super mass production level, but uh, definitely on some level and more than ever. And there is actually uh, a very interesting handloom uh, workshop this Friday afternoon on a rooftop in Brooklyn, uh, and that's uh, organized by Toast, that's a label that is working with fashion, and they are organizing this event, and it's open for all, but you need to register, I think, uh, you can find it on the Textile Month website. So I think it's interestingly, you know, something that is you know, creative people in general. And what is interesting, it, it isn't, doesn't mean that they need to be textile designers. It's no, right. artists and creatives. Absolutely. Interested in this medium. So, and there's all kind of, I mean, in Loop of the Loom, she is teaching beautiful way of, and there's a very interesting exhibition there on sour weaving. It's so beautiful. It's like, I've never seen such a, type of weaving before, the way they use the loom. It's a very simple way of weaving, but you can manipulate so much the, the, the process in the process. So, and the, the, the idea behind the sorry weaving is that you can never make a mistake. So it's a little bit contrast to often the accurate form of, of weaving. So there is so much interesting happening in that, that field. Um, there's another one, very interesting. Someone asked, what was the business advice your cousin gave you, Lori? <laughs> what didn't he give me? <laughs> I mean, I was, let me say this right now. I'm a creative and not a business person per se. And I did a business plan for my wall covering company that I started on a $100,000 loan from the bank. I started Weitzner Limited I mean, it's 15 years ago now on a $100,000 loan from the bank. I just want to say that again to all of you guys out there who are dreaming to do something. But I made a business plan that was completely wrong on inventory. <laughs> and um, the average order for a 
fabric is eight to 12 yards, the average order for a wall covering is 30 to 40 yards. Because other than a powder room, most people are using doing a whole room. But I based my whole business plan on the eight to 12 yard thing. So my inventory, I, I messed up so many. So there were business things that were operational things. There weren't aesthetic things. He got involved in the business side. He pulled apart. Why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing that? You need to spend money here, not here. Things that, and so when I say get a mentor, get a mentor in the areas, identify what you're not so good at, mm -hmm. what your strength, your, everyone has strengths and weaknesses and fill that void with those that are and listen to them. Too many times people get consultants and advisors and mentors, but they don't actually take their advice. My cousin said something very smart. He said, Lori, I'm a busy man. I know I'm retired, but I'm very busy. I'm on all these boards. I'm going to help you as long as you listen to me. But if you don't listen to what I tell you to do, unless you have a good argument against it, I will love you, but I will not help you anymore. And I listened to him. And I'm, I uh, thank you. I mean, I, it, it really helped boost my career. Wow, amazing. That's a very... And now he passed away so sad, too young from leukemia, but his son, David, has taken, taken the reins. Mm. Yes, thank you for sharing that with us. That's a very nice and personal uh, story. Um, Someone is asking how your New York-based teams team looks like. How is your New York team, Lori? What is my New York team? Yeah. Oh my God, I have the best team in the world. Mm -hmm. They're lean and mean and amazing and can do so many beautiful things. And I could never the things you just saw. Like, I mean, uh, I couldn't do any of it without them. <laughs> They are wonderful. And we have a really beautiful studio in Chelsea. It's called the White Box Sanctuary. It's really conducive to creation. I definitely made an intention that it would be separate to business, that it was a creative tank. And um, music and, you know, I, I'm very happy and I, I, love, I love my team very much. And someone is asking if you have ever worked with people in Mexico. I'd like to. I have worked only on some bark from the fig tree. We did wall coverings with bark from the fig tree, but I'd like to do more with Mexico. I'd like to do more. So countries I really want to work in that I'm not are South America, and I've never done anything there, and I'd love to, um, and I'd also love to work in Africa, but I'm, I've been trying and, and having not yet success. Mm -hmm. Here is a question related to that. How do you find the artisan communities and how do you negotiate uh, the financial compensation? <clears throat> well, the first, to answer the first part, it is not easy. And that question is asked at every presentation I give, no matter what. And sometimes I think people think it's like there's a quick answer to that. It's years and years yeah. of just traveling and meeting and networking and talking and this person may know this person and it's it's something that happens over a long period of time that's all i can say to that and on the second part of that question how we typically work is we work backwards so we look at the product that we're creating and we think about what we can sell it for and then we back backtrack to the margin we need to get to make it viable for us and then that we say to them, can you make this at that price? Because that would make, then we could sell it at a price we think is competitive in the market. And that's how we do it. So it's a really good way because right away we can, they can say, oh, you know, it's, that's easy. Absolutely, we can do it. Or they might say, no, it's gonna cost three times that much. And then we may have to say, you know what? This isn't a product we should do then because we'll never sell enough. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to wear that commercial hat in terms of what we sell it for but I mean it's you know it's all fair trade and it's discussing with them and a lot of times now over the years it's become a partnership mm -hmm. where we talk together and if it's too expensive we together come up with ways to maybe reduce the cost or if it you know etc mm -hmm. and someone is we have maybe a couple of more questions and someone is here 
say asking, I also studied as a printing major textiles and I totally feel you. Recently, I'm interested to dive deeper in the art textile industry. As you, are you familiar where are the job opportunities for developing products and researching within the field? And where are these jobs in the world mostly needed? Europe, US, India, or can they be remote? A big question. <laughs> um, first of all, I would ask if this person is interested in more in fashion or interiors, because mm -hmm. I think there is a big difference there in where you would find work and what kind of work. And even though the industry has shrunk, even though the industry has shrunk in a number of ways, we've lost a lot of mills to Asian mills and other things, consumption, you know, um, there are jobs out there, but there's, it's too vast a question to answer because are they more technical where they would want to work with a mill? Um, are they more aesthetic? Are they more about a yarns, about color? You know, textile, people just think textile is like, is like this linear thing, but it's not. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's really complex. So I guess my best advice would be first decide what you really love about textile, what part of it interests you the most. And then it's an easier question to answer. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll take care. There is, many of you have um, showed interest in sending, some of you sending lorries or material, some more uh, question or re personal request. I encourage you to go on our website and check find the email address and to contact her directly. But there's a very nice last question. Uh, Celia Absher, super wonderful. And you got a lot of nice comments, Laurie. You're amazing. <laughs> and she asks, I wonder what you're interested in exploring next. Well, I'll tell you. I'm actually, I, I, I just, this just happened. I've just decided this, but I'm going to exhibit at the Venice Biennale in um, spring 2022. Mm -hmm. I'm told I, and, and it's a concept that involves textile and color combined. And so for any of you out there who feel like coming, uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be the opening April 21st and 22nd in Venice. Ragna, I expect to see you there. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to book my flight now. <laughs> and I'm a little scared, nervous. It's out of my wheelhouse. It's out of my wheelhouse. I've never, you know, it sort of takes me back to when I was at Syracuse and I wanted to be a fine artist. And my teacher said, you're not good enough. And now I'm kind of like dabbling in that world. But it's something I feel compelled to do. I feel like someone's kicking me from behind, like to do it. And I keep finding reasons not to do it. And then they don't work <laughs> so i'm gonna do it I'm just gonna do it and if, if people don't like it okay oh it's going to be amazing we'll see sure. i mean I your instagram from italy was so interesting and nice to follow you when you were we'll in it i'll say one more thing yes. a dream a dream that's not yet been realized if i could ever just once design the costumes um for the ballet for for one ballet i just I want to do it and I want the ballet to be a, 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 someone to compose music to the 10 color worlds in my book. And it would be 10 different mini acts of a ballet hmm. that sh showed what each of those color worlds evoked. So I'm putting it out there to anyone who has any connections to any ballet group. Oh, that's, uh, that's <laughs> going to come to you. That's going to happen, I'm sure. We all have to dream. Someone, someone is asking, uh, can you tell us where the exhibition going to be the spelling? I'll be posting everything. Yeah. Um, follow me on Instagram if you like, Lori Weitzner, and believe me, you'll know everything about it. So great. Thank you so much, Lori. This was Thank such an you. inspiration and such a beautiful presentation, as always. Thank you. And, um, I think what we will do, we will send all of you a link that has a limited time open. So it's just going to be for you. And uh, we'll, 
uh, keep it open for a few days. So we encourage you to look at the present this recording of Laura's presentation. And then, like Laura said, you're welcome to contact her via email if you have. I saw someone was asking, offering her help in Brazil, and you know, there's a lot that happens. And beautiful comments. Um, you are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're, you're amazing too, Ragna. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of New York Textile Month, everybody. Yes, we will. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you, everybody, for attending. That was amazing. Right. Thank you so much.